Okay, welcome everybody to episode 37 of the Volatility Barometer. I am on a new computer, so hopefully all the technical issues are solved. I had a few issues. I'm glad I ran a test drive first before I went live. Caught a few things that would have been embarrassing, but I think we're live. So if, if you can't hear me for some reason, definitely shout in the comment section. I will see it and um, I will try to address it on the fly, but we should be good to go. So got a new MacBook finally. I know everybody knows about my computer issues and spreadsheet problems. So um, hopefully the new MacBook can solve a lot of it. And actually it's, it's working really well. That new M1 chip editing is lightning fast. So if anybody's sort of on the fence between upgrading or maybe waiting, the new one with the M1 chips are just light years ahead of the old one. So I bought a MacBook last year and then now I have to buy a new one this year because the last version was so bad. But uh, yeah, I fully endorse this new one. So um, thank you everybody for tuning in. We will go for the rundown. Today I want to make sure that there's plenty of room for the Q&A because the last couple live streams we've done there was, uh, it's actually pretty detailed stuff and we ran a little late. So definitely for today, I'll leave plenty of room for the Q&A. First of all, we're gonna go through a new series I'm launching here. I can show you a bunch of segments here that I've just got ideas for future episodes, but we're gonna go with that one called Social Media Fails. Now, I just wanna say, it might sound like I'm looking for social media beef and I'm gonna be calling people out. It's really nothing like that. Essentially, basically what it is, is I do spend some time on social media Sometimes you see something that is either correct and you want to expand on it. Sometimes you see things that are, you know, wrong and you might want to unpack it a little bit, but I'll certainly cover everybody's name. I'm not calling anybody out, but I saw something recently, got into a little conversation. So I just want to go over something to do with the risk factor differences between trading a one times and a 0.5 times product. Surprising a little bit. Some of you might not understand the risk factors there and how it actually compounds over time. And then we'll go over the short VXX trade really quickly. I get a lot of questions about that one. I had a whole video on it. And then of course, SVIX and UVIX have had a pretty successful launch, I would say. And we're just gonna go over their volume, check out the options, and maybe discuss when we can start jumping in for some trades there. So I did leave a poll. You can probably see that in your comment section, just which product you're gonna be using, the SVIX, which is a minus one times, versus the old SVXY, which is now 0.5 times. It's kind of the subject for today, so make sure you answer that poll, and let's run a little intro, and then we'll get started. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff, I'm a Canadian, and I'm a former professional golfer, so you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel, so you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email, every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so I've seen there's a few questions coming in already. A couple of good ones. Uh, I just noticed this one here. It's a big chunky looking computer. It actually is. The, the new MacBook is thicker and kind of boxy looking, but I have absolutely no fans running, which is amazing. For the sound quality, it's probably gonna be a lot better. The old one was thinner, got it right here, but uh, it's it just the fans turn on immediately. If you have two windows open, it's dead. So I'm actually really loving the new MacBook. And then there was another question, this. I'm definitely gonna circle back to this one. I just wanna highlight it, that's a good question. And if you do have questions that you want to get to in the Q&A, you can ask them now. 
do a little cue in front of it or say question, make it obvious that you're asking something and then it'll stand out more because sometimes people are having conversations amongst themselves. So it's a little easier for me to pick them out of the, uh, of the chat section. All right. So one last thing, you can definitely sign up for my free newsletter. It's in the first line of the description down in the YouTube, YouTube description down there. Um, you definitely want to sign up for that. You'll get notified future live streams, articles, videos, all the new developments coming for the future options launch that we're going to be doing. So you definitely want to sign up for that. It is in the description. All right. So let's get into what I was talking about and we'll start. Remember, this is the social media fails. First try at this. So definitely leave some comments. See if you like this. Maybe I can pick some that are slightly more controversial, slightly less maybe, but here we go. So the person says, this was basically sparked by a previous somewhat long conversation about people thinking that SVXY, because it's a minus 0.5 product these days, that it's basically dead in the water because the new product has now launched. So he says, SVXY isn't worth it to me. The original was much better until it almost blew up in 2018. And my response was, since losses hurt performance at an outsized rate versus gains helping, there's no reason why a good strategy couldn't make a 0.5 times product work just as well as a minus one times. So vol trading is almost always about reducing risk. Minus 0.5 times in some strategies will make more long-term than a minus one times will. All right, so that's kind of where we're at now. Let's keep going. So he responded and he said, how exactly would you get the same return from a 0.5 times product as from a minus one times product, unless you bought twice the position and used margin to do so. So I guess he's under the impression that you actually have to make some fundamental changes to your strategy in order to get the same performance. He says, I don't think you can get the same return without greatly increasing the risk. All right, so, so far, I don't know if anybody wants to leave comments now, but uh, wh what's your vibe on this so far? Are you leaning sort of the same thing? you definitely have to lay on a bunch of extra stuff to the SVXY, or do you kind of understand what I'm getting at so far? Feel free to ask some questions down there, but let's continue. All right, so I said the simple answer, because losses are also half as large. A minus one times product will quite regularly get chopped up and there's nothing a trader can do about it. You wake up, it's down 10 to 15% or more. So if we look at a chart of the largest VXX spikes, remember a minus one times inverse product will be the mirror image of that on the same single day. We can see in this column here, a lot of very big spikes. This is what I'm talking about, that if you're gonna be a volatility trader, waking up to extremely bad days is just part of the process. It's the same thing if you delve into the two times or the three times leveraged equity indexes. Those as well, everybody, you know, tries to use them strategically and so they can boost their profit. But it does also mean that you're just going to wake up to bad days because I'm sure you've seen in the past, but a lot of the market movement, in fact, most of the market movement does happen overnight. So this isn't something that we can even really protect against. Stop losses aren't going to work in the middle of the night. And then you wake up, the market's open and, you know, the VXX is up 30, the SVXY or the SVIX, you know, it's going to be down 30, down 40. And if there's something really terrible, it could be even worse. So that was my point. And also some people might be thinking, well, that's fine because I have a strategy that wouldn't have me in those trades. You can see over here, this is the M1, M2 VIX futures contango the day before. And you can see over half of these days, the VIX futures were in contango. And some of the other ones, you know, minus 0.3, there's a minus 0.6, minus 1.9. Several of the other ones are just mild, mild backwardation. So a majority of these days are happening when the market is calm and there's really nothing you can do about it. You just get gut kicked basically. So that's what I mean by you just wake up and it's down. A minus 0.5 lot loses less, mathematically gaining with each save. Long-term, it can add up to a higher profit. All right, you with me so far? So then he goes on to say, okay, a minus one, a minus 0.5 product is definitely less risky, but the potential return is also far less than a minus one times product. I doubt many people even bother with the SVXY once the SVIX has gained acceptance. Now this part I might actually agree with, but I responded by saying they may not, but that doesn't mean that they're right. Nearly nobody used the old ZIV and it was the best vol ETP of them all. I'll get into that later if you don't know what the ZIV was, but 
we lost that one too, unfortunately. And in my opinion, it was the best product out there. So more leverage is worse for the vast majority of traders. And I think most people would make more long-term with SVXY than SVIX. So maybe slightly controversial, I'll get into what I mean there. But I agree with his overall point that probably many people won't. People see the leverage, they just sort of gravitate towards that. But the reason that I'm trying to make this point is this chart here. And I'm sure you've seen something similar at some point. I've, I've said this quote hundreds of times in articles and videos, but losses are more costly to a fund than gains are beneficial. So if you have a drawdown of whatever percentage it is, the larger the drawdown gets, you actually need an exponentially larger rate of return afterwards just to get back to break even. So if you're talking about a 20% drawdown, for example, very normal happens, you know, pretty, I would say all traders at some point are going to suffer, you know, 20 to 30, somewhere in that range. You need a 25% rate of return after that just to get back to break even. So it might take a little while. If you're down 50%, it now takes a 100% rate of return after that just to get back to that high watermark that you hit before. So this is why it starts to really add up. If you have a 90% drawdown, well, now you need a 900% rate of return just to get back to break even. And of course, for reference, the old index, the minus one times inverse short vol index, it, it had a drawdown of 99%. So you're talking about just an absolutely insane subsequent rate of return to get anywhere close to where it was before. So the classic example that sort of illustrates this the most clearly, if a trader makes 50% this year and they lose 50% next year, right? So a lot of people will think, oh, that's break even, right? And you actually hear this a lot on social media. If you're actually out there reading people's tweets and there's actually people who actually pretend that they're real traders who sometimes say things like that. Somebody will say, well, you're down 30%, you know, what gives? And he'll say, well, it's fine. I was up 30% last year. Well, that's not really going to get back to break even, is it? If you understand the math involved here, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Some may think, well, okay, you're up 50, down 50, it cancels each other out and you're 0% over that two-year period, right? Well, that's not actually how it works, of course. The simple math of it is that if you start with 10,000, make 50, lose 50, your 10 turns to 15. You had a great year, good for you, you made 50%, but then you lose 50% the next year, you're not back to break even. You're actually down to 7,500. You're down 25%. And if anybody's wondering, of course, that works in reverse the same way. If you start with 10,000, you take the losing year first. Well, if you make 50% after having a terrible year and losing 50%, you're only back to 7,500. You're still the same thing, down 25%. So this is what I'm talking about, that essentially you're talking about products that can suffer major drawdowns. So you have to be very careful. You can't just assume that because something has more leverage that it'll automatically equal long-term returns. So as we know, the volatility ETPs, they all trade based on known methodology of tracking the VIX futures, right? The, the vast majority of them are going to be tracking these front two months. There's still a couple kicking around that are doing M4 to M7, but it's basically these ones here. And they track underlying indexes. So if we look at the old XIV, the minus one times short vol product, this index right here, 10 year chart, can see that it's actually pretty ugly. And this is basically a mirror image of the old XIV. Now minus a few very rare occurrences like the recent Barclays mess with VXX, but the vast majority of the time, all of the volatility ETPs track these indexes very closely. So this one is called the SPVX SPIT. This is the inverse daily front two month VIX futures index. Super ugly, you can see that it's down. Well, what if we looked at the one that's the SVXY? All right, it, it also tracks an index, the 0.5 times index. This one is called the SPVX SP, SP5I, I believe. Yeah, there we go. I know these tickers, they're confusing, but this is the SVXY over the 10 year period. Now, not great, there's still some big drawdowns, but you can see that the annualized return is 12. So it's, it's much, much better than the minus one times product. And this is actually to be expected because if we look at a chart of what's really going on here, here we've got the SPVX SPIT. This is the minus one, the old XIV. This person said that this was far better than this one until it actually terminated that single day on February 5th. 
And then we've also got the minus 0.5. So if we look at them together side by side, you can pretty clearly see what's going on here. The one product, the minus one times, when things are working out, yes, everybody seems to think that this is the better product, but it's actually minus 13% annualized. So that's every year average of minus 13. Whereas the SVXY product, not that anybody would buy and hold either one of these, that's obviously terrible, but you can see it's just substantially better. It's actually positive. Now, some people might be thinking, well, that's only because of February 5th, and that's partially true. I mean, it's not entirely because of that, but that was the worst day. So if we go down to February 5th and we make a little adjustment, you can see it was actually down 96% in one day. That's what I'm talking about, that gut kick that's sometimes hard to see. Now, that one probably wasn't that difficult to see, but you can see the inverse 0.5 is exactly half, or not quite exact, but basically these are mirror images of one another. So if we reduce that and we assume that somebody actually avoided Volpocalypse and it was just a run-of-the-mill bad day instead of being, you know, the truly epic day that it was, because it still was a terrible day. We can see here the top 25 largest VIX spikes. February 5th was the largest by far. Excuse me. So I'm not talking about just eliminating that day completely, but if we go to that spreadsheet and make a little adjustment, let's say it's a minus 50, right? At some point, that's going to happen again. You can just bank on it. And this one would be minus 25. That's probably about what we're expecting to be the high end of daily losses going forward. You know, obviously, if there's an October 1987, that's going to blank these. It's probably going to wipe out both of them in a single day. Even the 0.5 would be totally destroyed. I mean, the VIX, the old VXO went from in the low 30s to 172 intraday. So that's going to blank all these products on the inverse side. But now, if we adjust this, you can see what happens. It makes it better, but the SVXY is still, long-term, the safer product. You can do that same thing for avoiding other major crashes, and eventually you're going to turn that XIV into something that's better. But some people might be looking at this and saying, well, now it's pretty close. The max drawdown of 89 versus 62, that's kind of the same thing, right? When you're down 89 or 62, it's all in the same category. Something has gone terribly wrong and it's all the same thing, right? But remember the massive difference between those two drawdowns. Charts have no emotion. So when you're going through that chart on a back test and you're just looking at it, we don't really associate any pain points to that. We just see the numbers. But try to imagine 62% drawdown, that person needs to get 160% return just to break even. That is an insane rate of return afterwards. That might take a few years. But the person that's down near 90, well, I mean, this is going to take forever. So let's not assume that these are somewhat close. They're still miles apart as far as drawdown. The SVXY is just far superior to the, to the old XIV when you're talking about very little risk management going on. Now, I'll get into that in a second. But if anybody's interested, if we just back up a little bit... Hopefully I blanked both of those out. Yeah. If anybody's wanting to see the ZIV, just for reference, remember I said the ZIV is actually one of my favorite products. Can reset this. This is what the comparison looks like. ZIV in green now. And you can see why it's such a good product because it was performing when it needed to. And then during the big crashes, it actually didn't. And the reason that one's happening, unfortunately, we did lose this product. It was delisted when Credit Suisse, uh-oh. Something wrong. I noticed this with my new computer. Sorry. I have to do this four times and then it works. Um, so when we delisted the TVIX, the ZIV was one of them that kind of got buried there. Volume was very low, so nobody really cared, but kind of broke my heart, to be honest. But the ZIV was trading the M4 to the M7. All of the sort of the, the legacy brand, UVXY, TVIX, SVXY, they're all over here. The reason this midterm product was so good, you can see, as like I said, during stable markets, it's going to be moving in the right direction, right? During contango, during high roll yield, we're going to get that performance. But then you don't wake up to those massive, insane gut kicks either. I think it was only down, sorry, this might make you dizzy, 25% something. Where is that chart? 26% on February 5th. So definitely super manageable on that respect. But you can see why the ZIV for me personally was actually one of my favorite products. And I hope somebody out there, now that the SVIX and UVIX are going, 
it sure would be nice if somebody could actually get that going as well. So basically, to summarize this, I think everybody gets my point, but it really does come down to how well you manage risk. So for example, the minus one times SVIX, generally speaking, of course, it has more potential for profit because it is a more leveraged instrument. But you also have to expect that it's a near certainty that your drawdowns will be much larger as well. And that's not because I'm calling anybody a bad trader. It's just simply that a lot of bad things happen overnight. And those aren't, aren't really things that you can protect against. You're talking about things that move faster by very mathematical definition. It would be like saying, I can trade the two times NASDAQ with the same drawdown as I can trade the one times NASDAQ. Well, that's obviously not true. The two times might make you more if you've got a really good strategy during good times, but it's certainly going to cost you during bad times. And there's going to be some painful drawdowns. So if you are very good at managing risk, and I say exceptional, and I do mean exceptional because very few vol traders actually are. They know how to make money in good times. They don't have a plan when things go badly. But then in that case, the SVIX might actually be more suitable. If you can manage that risk, if you've got some way to through position sizing, through potential hedging, through timing the market and exiting to safety in plenty of time, you might be better off with that new product, the SVIX. But if you don't have stringent risk management, and this is where it's important to really analyze what kind of trader you actually are, then in that case, you would actually be better with the SVIX. And it's not for the reason that this person said. It's not for the reason that you have to leverage it up and increase the risk and take double positions and use margin. It is just simply this. This is the equation that a trader cannot escape. The larger your drawdowns, the longer it's going to take to recover from those. So S&P 500 crashes 56% in the financial crisis. That's why it took inflation adjusted six years to break even. I don't want to be in a drawdown for six years. So obviously I have to be able to manage that risk. And even if you're talking about a 60-40, like the Vanguard V-Banks, that was down nearly 40% during the financial crisis. And that took many years to recover as well. If you go back to the you know 2000 crash, there were periods in that market where it was in a drawdown for 13 years. So obviously managing risk is really what makes traders succeed in the long run. I know everybody wants to have those slam dunk years and Post your, po post your trades on Twitter and tell everybody you made 40%, but losing 40% is really disastrous for a portfolio. So you definitely want to avoid that. So that's the social media fail, the first one. I wasn't attacking the person. I think it's a very good point. And I actually do agree with him that the SVIX, the new product, probably given enough time, it probably will surpass the SVXY. I think people see that leverage and they just jump in. You know, traders are reckless. They the old ZIV didn't get much love, didn't get much, you know, liquidity was very low. The current VIXM, very low. Nobody trades those. I don't know why. They just, they see risk and they go for it. So it is what it is. So now we're going to review this short VXX trade really quickly. I just want to remind everybody that this is actually still available if somebody wanted to take it. The, um, the ongoing saga of Barclays breaking the VIX or the VXX, but this video, I basically went over an actual trade and executed it live on the live stream. So we're gonna check out that trade. What's the SPY doing? S&P about flat today. So we're gonna check out the VXX trade and this is it. So essentially just to recap really quickly, what Barclays did is they suspended share creations on the VXX which means that it's no longer tracking the indexes that it is supposed to. Remember, I talked about this. Every volatility ETP has an underlying index that due to the functioning of authorized participants, shorting it when it's getting a little bit too high of its indicative value, buying it long and increasing the volume when it's not, when it's a little below, and they are actually able to make it track this index very closely. But as soon as you suspend share creations, now all of a sudden everything's broken. And that's what we're experiencing here with the VXX. Remember I told you how to do the VXX, which is the actual price that it's trading, minus VXX.IV. That is the indicative value where it should be trading. And you can see, although it has come down a little bit, this is actually due to some share you know, redemptions and probably not so great here. I don't know if there's gonna be lawsuits, but they basically, they kind of screwed a lot of the people that are holding these shares. So if you are holding actual long shares of this thing, 
I, I never tell people what to do. I, obviously, I can't give out personalized investment advice, but I, I'm not sure if it would be a terrible idea to just take the gap because that's what essentially this is. The NAV value is trading above this indicative value. So there's an extra premium that should not be here. And essentially, what I did is I opened a trade to capitalize on the fact that probably because of the success of VXX, Barclays is going to want to fix this problem. And as soon as they do, this is going to snap back down to the NAV value or the indicative value. So I just opened, I gave six examples of trades we could take, and then I opened this one. So here's where it's trading right now, just to update this trade. And the indicative value is 2049. So if we mark 2049 on here, we're going to add a price slice, 2049. So it should be right here. When Barclays resumes share creation, very quickly, it's going to go back down to here. So this trade, while it is down right now, you can see we're all the way over here. I had a five-week duration. This thing expires on the 22nd of April. So I have two weeks left on this trade. And this happened three weeks ago. So I had five weeks on this, and it still hasn't fixed itself. Not saying I'm getting nervous, but come on, Barclays, fix this thing for me. So basically what's going to happen is it's going to snap down to here, and it's going to, if that were to happen tomorrow, for example, this trade would suddenly go into the green and I would be making money on it. And then I would want a couple of weeks of natural VXX decay, and I might be looking at a max gain. I could also, if Barclays doesn't make it by April 22nd, I'm looking at a max loss almost for sure. I mean, it's, it's possible that the actual NAV could decay that much as well, and the indicative would be all the way over here. But I pretty much need Barclays to fix this in the next two weeks or this trade is just gonna be one of those that just goes dead. Wait. Oh no. Sorry guys. Oh my God. Wait, okay, pause. I'm trying to figure out how long you were just staring at my dumb face talking and not... Oh no, did you watch that whole presentation or just the last little click that I did? Wow, that was embarrassing. Because, sorry everyone, because I have a new computer, I haven't ordered the things the same way that I did last time. I clicked the wrong one. I clicked this stupid rundown. I didn't click the screen share. Wow, that's embarrassing. How many people are here? Maybe, it, maybe it's a low volume day. Yeah. Got to apologize. I honestly, I have no idea how long I was doing that for. Pretty good chance I was doing that the entire discussion about this specific trade. So apologies for that. I'll just sort of flash these in front of you and you'll probably be able to fill it in. So this is where the, the nav is trading over the indicative. And then this is the trade, like I was saying, where the nav price is actually right here. Let me make sure I don't do this embarrassingly twice. Okay, so the nav value is here, and I said that the indicative is actually trading over here. So as soon as it snaps back, this trade is looking pretty good. But moral of the story, and I'm sorry, I totally butchered that. Um, I need Barclays to fix this situation, or that trade is uh, it's just going to be a loser. And it was only a 1% allocation. I always do. For me personally, I call these lotto ticket strategies. It's part of my options portfolio. They're called lotto ticket for a reason. They're, they're trades that can do very well. That trade, I risked, I think, 2,600 bucks. It can make 5,500. So it is a lotto ticket style, but you do actually um, lose the capital quite often as well. So you're hoping that the smaller number of gains that I do far outpace the times that you just, the trade doesn't work out, right? You might take a directional long call or something, think, you know, it could triple, but those trades also quite often lose money as well. So that's what it is for me. It was a lotto ticket trade. And I don't know, I, I still think it's 50-50. I think Barclays might actually be able to clean this up. But um, let's check out the chat, see if anybody was screaming at me. We can't see the chart. No, you can't. No screen sharing. I am so sorry. I'm just going to, because my memory, when I'm doing live streams, it's actually quite nerve wracking. I'm just going to have to assume that hopefully during the social media part, I hope you weren't staring at me during that as well. Um, that, that's just would be a total disaster. So let's finish this and get to the Q and A. Cause I think I already blew this, but number three, SVIX and UVIX are trading now. Of course they are up and running. And like I said, 
I consider it a pretty successful launch for both of these. I know some people, I've seen some negative comments like, oh, it can only manage 500,000 shares. That's actually pretty decent. I think SVIX and UVIX were both doing about 500,000 in the last day or two. That's pretty solid, to be honest. And I, I'm not sure what I was really expecting. We'll see how long this takes. But I think trajectory wise, I think it's doing pretty well. And I would not be surprised if these were considered sort of mainstream, larger volume, maybe not to the point of UVXY or SVXY or even VXX when it fixes itself. I don't expect they'll get to a billion anytime soon, but I suspect they'll be in the 100 million, 200 million range before too long. Like, you know, maybe let's see within a month or two, if we could get these over 100 million each in a month, I think that that would be pretty solid. Now, I've already gone through it. We did live streams on it. Um, I The UVIX doesn't really interest me that much, but um, we can also check out the options because those are live. You can check out the volume on the options. So we'll do UVIX first. I suspect UVIX options will be a little bit more utilized. Probably the volume will be a little bit higher just because when you're trading options, the fact that it's a two times leveraged product matters a little bit less. You can start using option strategies to control that risk. Whereas if you're buying the ETF, boy, that's taking on a lot of leverage. And there's only a certain few situations where holding the UVXY or UVIX or shorting it when that starts to become available is going to be feasible. That's a risky trade. But the options, I don't know, the, the volume is pretty low. You can see the open interest here. 500, not too bad, 204. It's a low dollar price. So these are actually kind of low as well, but it's picking up, which is good news. Let's check SVIX really quick. I think SVIX is lower and I think it should be lower. I think that SVIX is more of a product that people will utilize within longer term trend following strategies. And UVIX will be a product that people are looking to do option strategies on. That's just my guess. I could be totally wrong. But so far, the open interest on um, SVIX isn't that high, barely any people. So I would say overall, it's probably not ready quite yet. Uh, let other people be the guinea pig. Let other people get in there and lose a little bit on those bid ask spreads, the wide bid ask spread. You know, Entering trades is oftentimes much easier than exiting. So you have to always be aware of that when you're options trading. You might enter a trade and you think, oh, it actually went in just fine. What's really the problem is in a fast moving market, if you have to actually get out of the trades, that's where you need the liquidity. Liquidity getting in, especially because it's a vol ETP, typically trades based on the underlying volume of the futures market more or less. And market makers know that, they know how to hedge it, and they know that the actual issuing banks have share creations and all that. So volume isn't really a problem getting in. And I suspect you could even get into those trades in a reasonable fashion today. But I think it's too early to expect that if there was a mad rush for the exit, that it would be smooth and um, and you wouldn't lose a little bit on the way out the door. So I would wait. I would hold on a bit, but can't tell you what to do. If you're ready, go for it. Just trade small, high frequency, you know, or high, high occurrences, not large number of trades, small capital during each trade. Manage your risk. Should be just fine. All right. Sorry again about that. Butchered it. Would it be too much to ask for everybody to like the video, even though it's terrible today? Yeah, that's probably pushing it a little bit. You don't have to like the video. I screwed up. All right. Let's get into some of these questions. So, this one here, I like this question. Why aren't more casual people putting in the work to research financial markets? Since it can be much more rewarding than getting a pay raise every few years. Not many people talk about this, but this is an excellent point. I've written articles about this in the past that if people just knew the math, if they just ran the numbers between how much a 1% increase rate of return over your investing lifespan would mean, and that's what he's getting at is essentially that that amount is going to be more than the work that you're putting in and the pay raise and all of that stuff. And something that is oftentimes, maybe me saying it is going to make a few people look inward and say, you know what, I'm kind of guilty of that as well. So think about this. First of all, how much time do you actually spend on a daily basis, just an average? I understand some days it'll be more, some days you'll just skip it. But how many hours a day do you spend on your investing, right? I think most people, 
Truthfully, the answer is probably zero for almost everybody, but for even people who call themselves investors, might be 30 minutes, might be 15 minutes. So if you, if you think about it, the average person works about 1,800 hours per year making their money, right? That's what it calculates out to. If you add up a whole year of your work life, it's about 1,800, 2,000 hours of work. How many hours a year do people spend in their investing? Five, 10, zero, most people zero. The money that, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You spend 2,000 hours working and making the money and you spend zero hours managing the money or at least watching the person that you've put in charge of managing your money and making sure you understand the process and what's going on. It's just, there's a disconnect there. And I think this question nails it that, yeah, you'd be surprised how much of a difference if you just got a little bit more educated. Basically what it could come down to is avoiding one or two mistakes a year. That's it. If you were just a little more educated and you could just sidestep a few landmines, maybe once every couple of years, depending on how big the mistake is. If you could just sidestep that by increasing your education, that would pay off more than any amount of pay raises. I mean, one or 2% a year compounded over time, over 30, 40 years is a massive amount of money. So yeah, great question. I love that one. And yes, people, all people, everybody, I don't care if you're an accountant, you're a teacher, you're a police officer, whatever you do, don't overlook the fact that 40 years of compounding investments can eclipse your income. So uh, think about it that way. Give it some thought. How many hours a year do you spend on your investing? Probably not enough for most people. All right, I'm short a lot of VXX put and hedge with long-term put, okay? Should I be worried about VXX going to zero? I'm short a lot of VXX puts and hedge with long, well, it depends on how strong your hedge is. I mean, you're talking about a calendar style strategy here, or maybe a diagonal if they're different strike prices. Depends how strong the long is compared to the short. If you've done the long that's really extended into the future and you're selling very short dated VXX puts, then of course your hedge is gonna be very weak in that sense. The, the losses that could accumulate if the VXX goes down could far outpace the strength of that long VXX put. But um, without knowing more details about your trade, I don't know. Now VXX technically will never go to zero. It will either always trade and just function completely normally, or it will be redeemed. Those are really the only two options here because again, I wanna highlight, they do track the underlying indexes minus, of course, let's give this really crazy situation with Barclays, let's consider it a massive outlier, but 99.9% .9 of the time, it is just tracking this index. The way that this index works is it is a rolling constant one month maturity. So the price itself of the VXX makes zero difference in this equation. It will always trade. When it gets too low, they're just gonna do a reverse split and it's gonna go right back up and it's gonna keep going. It's going to track what this index is supposed to track, which is essentially, they are tracking the decay factor of a rolling combined 30 day maturity based on the number of days to expiration. So the VXX is holding a combination of these two and that's what it's tracking. And it does track very well. I understand that there's certainly room in the last couple of weeks for some snide comments like, oh, it tracks, does it? What about Barclays? I know, I get it. But 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not the case. So should you be worried about it going to zero? No, that's not a concern. But what you should be worried about is if the VXX does decay very quickly, let's say Barclays does resume share creation and the market goes up or something at the same time, you could see the VXX down five or six dollars in a day or two. That, based on what I'm reading here and what I'm probably guessing your strategy is, I would imagine that's gonna hurt a lot more than that long put that you've purchased is gonna cover you on. And what a lot of people do, it's basically, again, my option strategy called the calendar roll where you, the long is farther dated. And then the goal is to sell several short dated against it. Hopefully the money you make on the shorts is gonna cover the one long and you're gonna be in profit range. But that hedge is not very strong in that case. So yeah, you should, you should run your simulations and you should figure out, well, what's gonna happen if they resume share creations? What's gonna happen if VXX decays 5%, 10% in a week? 
It could start adding up for sure. Do you think China is getting hurt by investors leaving the Chinese stock market? Not really because um, foreign, I don't want to say foreign is in like all blanket, but a lot of foreign economies, they're not, they're not set up like we are in the US, in Canada, where equities are a, a major portion of, of the economy and of people's net worth. And there's like in China, I, I don't know what the numbers are off the top of my head, but it's not even close. I mean, the number of people that are actually significantly invested in that, I don't even think it really matters. So um, it's super volatile. It's a, it's a crazy wild, wild west type market. And um, no, people make money, people lose money. I, I think on a net, you know, net gain, net loss, I don't even really think it matters. In the US, totally different scenario. A lot of people's net worth is highly, you know, based on the price of their home and the price of the equities market. So if things started going off the rails here, I think a lot of people would start realizing that they're not quite as wealthy as they thought they were. It's kind of like on paper gains. So it, we are heavily affected by that. If there was just an en masse exit of the stock market and a 50% drawdown, I think, I mean, it would be financial Armageddon. I, I don't even know what would happen if we saw, if, if in 2022, we ended down 50%, I don't even know what would happen to the Western economies. It would, it would be a disaster. Um, question. Good. I like that. When people say question, I can spot them easy. All right. Often short VIXM can substitute for VXX for those risk averse. Likely not, not a good idea because VIXM has very low volume. However, there are, are there any times when you found midterm vol to be mispriced and thus would want to be short VIXM, but not VXX? So for the first part, no, I wouldn't consider VIXM a short target. I just, like I said, it's not so much, shorting in general is just a terrible idea. A, you're not in charge of your trade. Obviously, that's a bad idea to put your financial future in the hands of somebody else. You can get those shares called away. And typically, they're going to be called away at the worst possible time. It's not, they're not going to ask you. They're not going to say, hey, do you mind if we take these back? It's just going to be the market does something crazy and you lose your shares at the worst possible time. So you always want to be in charge of your own trades, which means don't ever short something. But secondly, of course, unlimited loss. That's not a good idea either. But, and then fees. I mean, there's so many. I could make a whole video about the ways you shouldn't short things. But the second part's interesting. So yes, there is a difference between the front month and the midterm structure. And I would submit, it's really hard to prove something like this because you can't go back in time and see with and without something. But I've noticed that the midterm futures are not behaving nearly as predictably as they used to. And I suspect, at least partially, that could be because there are very few volumed products trading those products anymore. Everything is the front end of the curve. So we'll see in a few months, in a few years, but the, the launch of SVIX and UVIX might actually have a little knockoff effect of making the front two futures a little bit more smooth and stable. And we might actually see higher levels of contango in the front end of the curve because of them. Whereas we've got nothing going on over here. So it's just not behaving well. Plus the second thing is, of course, these midterm futures, what are they? They're longer dated, right? So when people are playing out in the M4 to M7, it's a long ways in the future. The front end, people are still comfortable saying that, okay, the market might be stable and calm and we might be playing here. But long term, there's a lot of people who think the next crash is like two months from now. Like it's, it's right there. There's so many bad things, but they'll play the front end of the market, but they're not so convinced that seven months from now that there's going to be some consistency. So I think that just given the environment that we are in, I think there's a massive mispricing between the two parts of the curve. Hard to prove. Well, impossible to prove, but I suspect. Okay, how do you work out the percent required to get back to baseline after a certain drawdown? Well, it's just a, you know, just the math equation. I don't want to bore people, but it's super easy. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can, you can Google it if you'd like, but yeah, you can probably just figure it out too. You just put two, two fractions on both sides and one missing number, what do we do? You know, you do, do the angle thing. Um, yeah, I want to let, let people do a, do a little bit of it. All right. I think I missed, yeah, I'll come back. 
Did you have another metric another metric miss on 329? It was a duplicate of 328. Like in my email, I said one of the metrics and it didn't update. It's possible. When did I get my new computer? Probably right on that date. So I think I mentioned that I was transferring over spreadsheets, which I'm really happy. My new spreadsheet, it does beach ball a little bit, but I've actually, it's better. So uh, I don't know. Sorry. If you're using those metrics and maybe email me and I'll give you the actual updated list and make sure that it's definitely correct. Okay, any hint VXX will come back to life. I know nothing. Nobody knows anything. It'll just happen one day or it won't. Um, I'll be rolling tomorrow my call spreads, 23 short, 24 long, that expire next week. Never thought it would be dead for so long. I'm kind of with you. So for my trade, I let it... Um, I thought five weeks was going to be enough duration here for this trade. I The last time it happened in 2012, happened with TVIX, it took basically a month dead on, uh, I think a month and a day or something like that. But I suspected that just given the success and the volume and the fact that this wasn't really a major issue, it was more just a clerical error, I actually kind of agree with you. I thought they'd fix this sooner. So this trade should have probably been closed out already. I actually did another one for May and there was this weird shakeout. I'll show you what happened. I don't even know what happened with the options premium, but I had a May long as well that I opened after that trade. And right when we got this shakeout here, for some reason it shot up and shot down. And on the other side of this, my premiums were way higher than they should be. And I thought, well, that can't be right, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna input the trade and just see what happens. I mean, I'm not expecting to get this thing filled. This, it shouldn't be the case, but it filled, so. I actually got out of one of mine at a profit already, which was surprising. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you think, well, I'm probably not going to get this price, but let's just throw it up there and see. And heard the little bell and it went. So, but I'm with you. I'm surprised. 50-50, um, I'm still fairly confident. Two weeks is a long time. If they miss and I miss, that's five weeks they didn't have this fixed. And that's going to be, it's already going to be disastrous for VXX, but... Um, if they don't fix this in five weeks or eight weeks, or, you know, it's just a dead product, everything will go to VIXY. And there would be no reason at that point to even do VXX because it's not nearly as profitable as people think it is. People think, oh, wow, it's such an incredible product. We should just, you know, banks are just raking in the money hand over fist. It's not really like that. You have to remember that it's an ETN. They have massive margin leverage that they have to carry on their books. It's, it's not nearly as profitable as people think it is. So the idea that it would be redeemed, I mentioned that in my whole live stream initially, and it, it's a long shot still, but it's not out of the question. They might just say, look, th this is not fixable. The, the brand is dead. Basically, people hate it anyway. They're going to go to these new ETF products. They do track the short vol, long vol indexes, so they're structured a little better. I don't know. I'm still 80-20. I said on Twitter, I'm 80-20. 80%, they'll still try to fix it but I still think there's a 20% chance that they'll just say, you know what, this is, we're out. We're out of the VXX. Yeah. And remember, I will, I will mention again, this is important to say, if that is the case, and if you are holding long shares, just remember that if they do redeem those shares, which means that they are basically accelerating it and taking those shares from you, everybody's going to assume, well, that's fine because the VXX is way higher than it should be. And I'm going to get a nice payment. You're not. They're going to mark that to the indicative value all the way down at 20. So it's trading at 25 now. If they redeem those shares on you and you're long, you think you're going to get 25 bucks a share, you're actually going to get $20 a share. So just be aware of that. If you are long shares, there's a lot of uncertainty there and you, you might actually get the rug pull. So, And there will be no legal recourse either. I, I suspect that their lawyers have covered their bases completely and there's going to be no legal recourse. They're just going to take the money. All right. I don't know if this is an insult or uh, consoling my mistake there. Only 50 people watching right now. It's fine. I could read that. Only 50 people watching. Nobody cares what you're saying. Or I could read that. It's okay. Your mistake. It's fine. You know, two ways. I'm going to read it the second way. Yeah. Like I said, I just hope that you guys weren't staring at me the entire presentation because that would just be 
I think if that if that was the case, everybody would have left, right? So um, we got to watch that cat, so it's fine. Yeah, she. I, I I work. I sit here. Sometimes I'll go to Starbucks, but lately I have not been. So I mean, she will just lay with me all day from the the moment I wake up. First thing I do is get a coffee, come to the computer, and start working. And oftentimes she's waiting for me. And then, yeah, she, literally 12 hours. I was on my computer in this chair all day long, 12 hours, and she was right next to me. So very helpful. Maybe I can pull her back a little bit. There you go. All right, question. Would a pairs trade make sense knowing VXX will drop and match UVXY eventually? Go short VXX, butterfly puts, and then long UVXY. Well, be careful because there's a leverage difference there. The VXX is a one times long and the UVXY is a 1.5 times long. So you'd want to run those numbers. The, there's nothing wrong with doing a pairs trade. The problem is you do have to do it with options. So there's an, an additional variable there. Remember, if you short something directly, if you did a long short pairs trade, you don't want to be long or short the VXX for sure and you never want to short anything. So those pairs trades, I always say just no for sure. But as far as running an options pair trade, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just an, an additional layer of leverage difference. But yeah, it's not a whole lot different than the trade that I took. It's a lotto ticket. I don't mean to imply that it's a million to one or something, but it's a trade that there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of uncertainty. If what you think is going to happen is that Barclays will resume share creation, it's going to snap down to the indicative value, then great, They're, your lotto ticket pays off. If that doesn't happen for you, your trade's going to lose money. It's the same as my trade. I wouldn't say one is better than the other. It's just a different style. So um, if I'm right, I'm going to get a nice big profit. If I'm wrong, I'm going to lose the full premium. So. <clears throat> Shorting mistakes. Do you mean like a like a top five reasons to never short a, a stock or ETF video? I could do that. I think I basically did them, but um, yeah, there's a, just, I don't see any reason you would ever want to do that. It just doesn't. But then again, I mean, sometimes the people, the things that people do just Maybe it's just me. Maybe I just don't get it. But I just think that's a terrible idea to just give over control to somebody. And then you're talking, I'll add another one to the list. The, your broker can increase the maintenance requirements at any time. And that happens a lot. There's just all kinds of ways that that could go badly. So no, don't do that. Did you read this article, the VXX plot thickens with Barclays? 450 million structured notes loss. Yeah, I read that article. There's actually one that came out a couple days ago. Not a full article, but I read some quotes from somewhere that uh, they did start to redeem some shares on people. So I, I suspect it's possible that that's what that little shakeout was there. That's why it's going down right now, because it was actually approaching about six there, six bucks over the indicative. I, I think they're starting to redeem stuff, which is not good news for anybody who was holding them, because like I said, they're going to be redeeming down here. They're going to be ripping profit off of people's trade. They think they're getting this price, and they're actually going to be paid this price when their broker finally, you know, you're going to notice that your shares are gone. And I don't know if it happens immediately or if it takes a little while, but when you do get your money, it's not going to be as much money as you were expecting. So yeah, I, I, they might be actually fixing it right now in the last two days. And maybe that's how they're fixing it, is they're cleaning up all of those, you know, over allocation things. And I know who knows. I got two weeks. Come on, April 22nd or before. That's all. All right. If shares redeemed, what would happen to the options? Well, the options would... Okay, so... The problem there is that the options aren't actually related to the ETF. They're not the same people running it. Of course, options are independent. They're run by market makers. Um, what would end up happening, I suspect, but I've I've never actually trade. I've never traded something like this. We've traded situations like in the past when the SVXY deleveraged from one times to 0.5 times. 
they can't adjust the options because that's a totally different thing. So what ended up happening is they just screwed all the option holders. If you were short, I mean, too bad. Sorry that happened. But in this case, would they market to the indicative? I would say no. Now, I'm not sure about this. Don't hold me to this. You might have to come back next week and tell me I was wrong. But I suspect they're going to have no choice but to mark the options to the nav. So long holders would probably mark down to the indicative and option traders would probably have to mark to the nav price, just the price that it's actually trading at. So that's going to be interesting. I don't, I don't really know. I've never seen this situation before. I've never traded through a situation like this before. What happens if you are short and they redeem? Same thing, mark down. Just be aware that it's not going to mark to the nav. It's going to mark to the different one. So depending on if you're long or short, there is profit to be made or a rug pull waiting to happen. Depends. Question. You mentioned often crowded traders or inflows. Which data and where to look to figure out something is really crowded or not? What analysis? So I think what you're getting at is when I tell people how much at risk the volatility ETPs are to a single day liquidity crisis, you know, February 5th type thing. And all you'd really want to do for that, it's really not difficult. You have to understand that the volatility ETPs, it's the leveraged products that are all rushing out to buy those futures to rebalance, right? And they're all buying the same futures. I made this point in a few, couple weeks ago in a live stream got a ton of follow-up emails. People didn't understand it. But essentially, if you're long, if UVXY, 1.5 times long, at the end of the day, they have to do a rebalancing. They have to go out and buy a bunch of VIX futures because they're going to have to go into the next day with their leverage factor. So the volatility spikes that day. They make a nice profit. The, the ETF goes up, but the leverage will, will be less than they are targeting. It's not going to be 1.5 after that. So they have to go out and buy a bunch of VIX futures to reset their full 1.5 leverage for the next day. Something like the SVXY, you might think, okay, well, it's a large product as well, and it's selling the same future. So there's no net effect here. But actually, if the SVXY suffers a big, big volatility spike, it has lost money that day, right? And now what do they have to do? They have to cover those shorts that they're holding. So they have to go out and buy the VIX futures as well to cover all of their shorts so that they can go into the next day whole again, like they're tracking their methodology. So it is actually a situation where all the leveraged DTPs, both long and short, are going out and buying the VIX futures. So what you're going to want to do is make a little spreadsheet, a little list. I do it all the time. It's not difficult. Just make three or four of the top volatility ETPs. You can add SVIX and UVIX and keep track now because they'll probably ramp up. But SVXY, VIXY, UVXY, those three, put the volume and then cross-reference that on the SIBO website. Just check the VIX futures volume. If that ratio is getting in the high percentiles, then you can start to wonder, well, if there is a very terrible day, kind of wondering, is, is there going to be enough VIX futures volume to handle $2 billion of you know, volatility ETPs that have to rebalance. That was the problem on February 5th, is there's over $5 billion of assets under management. The VIX futures were just not large enough for that. So like we talked about, SVIX, UVIX kind of solves the problem a little bit by using two different indexes, 15 minute window, they're basically averaging at five second increments. They did a lot of improvements, but you're still talking about the UVXY, SVXY, VIXY. Um, or not the VIXY, but you're talking about two very large products. I think combined that would be 1.6 right now million for those two. I think UVXY is about 1.2. Maybe SVXY is a half a, mil half a billion at this point. It's definitely over 400. So just keep track. Rank percentiles. Just equals percent rank. Figure out where it's at. If it's above 80 percent, might want to default to the options market rather than... Uh, the ETFs. Hopefully that made sense. All right. Hmm. See if there's any more that stand out. I've been going for an hour. So one thing I'm trying to get better at is stopping at the hour. So I will 
scour for one more question. Here we go. Trying to invest in, I don't know. I think I got them all. Maybe, bear with me. How do you work out? Oh, I got that one. Do you have another metric miss? The thing that I'm always wondering is because I don't get shown all the comments and it's unfortunate that for some reason my software doesn't show them all. And then I, when I edit backwards the questions and I timestamp it, I actually see a lot of really good questions that I didn't get to see during the live stream. So what I might start doing, I actually added it here, segments. It's one of these, question in focus. I might start when I'm in the process of editing these live streams down, I might actually make a note of the questions and come back the next live stream and answer a few of those as well. Because sometimes there are some good ones. That was embarrassing. You guys are just staring at me talking for five minutes, pointing and using the cursor. Hey, see this thing going up and you're just staring at me. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Okay, this is the last one. Oh, Igor, now, now the name rings a bell. Okay, my friend is, has had some troubles with these Volley TPs and is, um, is pursuing legal action. So I found a law firm willing to take on a class action against Barclays. Only caveat, they want a pool of people to have a minimum two to three million claim all combined. So for small fish, the only hope is to team up. That's how they almost always work. Um, class action lawsuits, you're going to want to find a bunch of people that were impacted by the same thing. You'll, you'll have no luck at all if you're just saying, well, they, they took my money, I don't understand. Like, let's say you were holding long shares and they redeemed and they marked it to the indicative like they are going to, and you thought you should get the NAV. Well, I mean, I'm, I guarantee you that's in the prospectus. I've actually read it in the prospectus. So that's just something that people didn't know. And unfortunately, that's just gonna be money gone. If you really think that you were wronged somehow, legally wronged, and you have a course of action, I think in that case, if your lawyer is very well known and connected, maybe they could help, but essentially you might want to take it on yourself. Now, I will say, unfortunately, and I feel bad telling you this, but we've emailed several times and I told you basically the same thing. I wish, obviously, that you didn't lose money. And I wish there was a way for you to get it back. I really do. That would be fantastic. I am never on the side of the financial industry. But as I explained to you, the prospectus is long for a reason. And there's teams of lawyers that write those things. And everything that happened is in there. Unfortunately, I, I hate saying this, but it is in there. So you might want to go the social media route and write some articles and see if you can get them out there and get drum up some interest and ask around. I don't even know how somebody would approach that. I don't even, if I thought I was wronged and I wanted to, to round up a bunch of people who lost 3 million or more, I don't even know how I would do it. So, and I have a, a little bit of a following. I don't know how people who don't have a social media following would even achieve that. But again, I don't mean to discourage you. If you want to go down, then go for it. Just, you know, Go, go right to the end, but I just, I'm not sure you're going to have much luck here, unfortunately. I, Barclays, I don't think they did anything illegal. I just think they did something really rotten. Like just, it's just a terrible situation where it just, it just shouldn't have happened, but I don't think it's illegal. Or at least if it is illegal, it's not illegal enough that they would get punished. I mean, how many illegal things happened in the financial crisis. And there, I think there was one dude who barely had anything to do with it. I think he, he got jail time, but pretty much everybody who actually caused the crisis and did all the financial engineering and, and terrible things behind the scenes, I don't think you're gonna ever get those people to be accountable, so. All right. Oh, here's a new one. Why don't you, why don't you enter vol trend butterflies only when the price goes against you? Last butterfly I purchased at a minus 50 credit and exited yesterday at 19, almost $70 per butterfly. Well, that's because the price went up, right? So you, you entered an extremely aggressive butterfly to get a credit of 50 cents and then the price goes up. So yeah, you're, 
long delta, you're going to, what is she doing? She's falling off the desk. Um, yeah, you're going to make money on that. But that's, and great, good trade, obviously. Um, I like when people make money. But what you have to remember is it could have gone the other way. You could have been in a situation where the UVXY decayed another 10% or something, and your trade would have immediately started going against you. So be careful when you say, well, why don't you do this? Because I did this and it made money. Sure, you could do that, but I didn't know the UVXY was going to go up 10% in the next day or two. So if I knew that ahead of time, surely I would have gone in a big credit trade and I, I would have had the same thing as you. So I'm glad you did it and made money. But the reason that I try to go fairly close to zero credit, sometimes you can get a credit, sometimes you pay a little bit of a debit. But the reason is, is because that's a good balance between the rest of my portfolio. Remember, what I'm actually trying to do is make sure that my UVXY trade doesn't lose too much money that it overshadows all of the net long equities positions that I have going. I would like to know that if this trade, where is it sitting now? It's sitting really good right now. So, I mean, if tomorrow's up, like if it's, if it's a decent S&P up 0.5% tomorrow, this trade could be very successful. But what I'm trying to do is structure it so I'm not going too quickly over here. If you do a minus 50 credit, your price is going to be all the way over here because that's a super aggressive trade. It's not actually that far to the full loss. Now, again, that's not a terrible thing because we are net long equities and two times leveraged in the Dow. But at the same time, you don't want to invite that to happen in one day. You'd rather have it three or four days of massive UVXY decay. I can collect a lot of money on the net longs and it, I won't even care if this trade loses money. If you start going for massive credits, it's fundamentally a different trade. I'm not saying it can't work. It's just not, the math doesn't work out anymore based on what my portfolio looks like. If your portfolio was not net long, then your trade might look different than mine and it should look different than mine. This is a trade that is very portfolio specific. So I can't do some blanket statement and tell you, well, you should always get this credit or trade them at 40, 40 cents. I don't know. I'd have to know what your portfolio looks like. I know for mine, that would be a mistake. That would mean that the trade is max loss in one day and my net long the market didn't make enough in the one day and that's that trade's going to hurt now. I'd rather just, you know, blank it out if that happens. So our portfolios are probably different. Unless you're following VTS literally exactly, then, um, then it wouldn't be. But yeah, good trade. Glad you made money. I wouldn't get into the habit of doing that though. That's too much credit to bring in. All right. So apologies for the stupid, I can't believe I did that. I have to make sure that the order of my scenes here going through. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I, really I think that's the thing. The intro is one slot down. Sorry about that. I knew it. I got a new computer and I was, I was thinking there's going to be some technical difficulties, but uh, next time. I promise. Well, I don't promise. I'm always technical difficulty. All right. Kat wants to go out of the room. So uh, thank you everybody for following and we will do another one next week. Thanks.